Hello, everyone. This is episode 14 of the Revolutionary Think Tank podcast. If this is your first time here, this is a podcast about political commentary, its music, and revolutionary thinking. My name is 4AS, and this is my co-host, Mr. E. So, Mr. E, how are you going today? I am very well. Thank you, 4AS. How are you? Yeah, I'm going pretty well. And I thought, why don't we keep the ball rolling? Uh, you know, we were talking about a, like a revolutionary undertone fil- uh, film last week mm-hmm. uh, with Monsters, Inc. Uh, this was actually a suggestion by one of our listeners, uh, Luna Langton. Um, she thought, why not, you know, since we did Monsters, Inc., why don't we do A Bug's Life? Because yeah. that has some revolutionary undertones as well. Mm-hmm. Yes, I think it's um, quite well known this one in particular, uh, mm. for its revolutionary um, drive. Um, it's quite overt. I don't think you really have to read too much into it. Um, and it's something that I think a lot of people are able to relate to um, quite well. I think um, the scene where Gra- the grasshopper, the leader of the grasshoppers is talking to his own people about the dynamics and how things are really run, I think that's etched into many a person's memory out there. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's a good, it's definitely a good place to, to continue the conversation mm. on a uh, revolutionary cartoons. Well, uh, not only that, but before I go into a recap of the film, just in case people haven't seen it, uh, it is interesting that this tale is a twist on the Aesop's fable of uh, the ant and the grasshopper, because obviously um, that's a tale of um, a story of during during the summer, the grasshopper, you know, goes about its business, laughing and singing and um, doing its thing, uh, whilst the ant during the summer is stocking its food and getting ready for the winter. And then um, depending on what version you have of the story, uh, when it becomes the winter, the grasshopper realizes, oh, there's no more food around. It begs it for its life to not starve to death to the, to the ant. And the ant, uh, ant says, well, I've got a family. I've got people to feed. Uh, no, go away, grasshopper. You didn't put in the work. Um go and starve for for what i care and that's basically the moral of the story is that Mm. if you basically um uh frivolously live your life then you know you will suffer the consequences and it's interesting because obviously this film uh takes that aesop's fable and um well basically turns it into a revolutionary tale Mm. yes So, um, yeah, I guess since we're here, we might go into a quick recap. So for everyone that hasn't seen um, seen this movie, uh, this is a tale about an ant colony that's basically living on a, on a hill near where a, um, a lake is. And you follow the main characters, which is um, the queen of the ant colony, uh, Princess Anna, and uh, Flick, who's a bit of an inventor, but also a troublemaker. And basically during the spring, when all of these ants are collecting their food, um, they also have uh, building up their food where they have a section of their food that they're going to offer to uh, the grasshoppers, which are are kind of their their landlords, if you will. Um, Collection money, isn't it? Yes, uh, it, 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 and, uh, protect them from all the scary insects that are out there, right? Yeah, exactly. And they're, they're basically having their offering protection money, if you if you will, uh, Mister E. And uh, Flick, in during one of his adventure, uh, one of his inventions goes wrong, and he basically destroys the offering. It like goes into the lake, and. In uh, when and this is right before the grasshoppers come, so obviously the grasshoppers come, they're angry and they say, Well, you know, we'll let you off this time, but you have to double your your yield before the end of summer. Like we're gonna be we're gonna be back when the last leaf falls in autumn to collect our dues. Um, so obviously everyone's ang- um, angry and Flick doubles down on his sort of, I guess, out of the box thinking. And he's like, oh, well, why don't we 
go why don't i go out venture to bug city and find us some warriors to fight the grasshoppers because you know what they're doing is um is wrong so he obviously goes off and the reason the ant colony agrees to this because they think oh well flick's a troublemaker we'll just get him out of uh, out of our way Mm -hmm. um but Unbeknownst to them, he obviously heads up. He mistakes a bunch of circus bugs as warriors uh, because during their acts, they kind of act like warriors. So there's a bit of miscommunication there. And um, he, he obviously eventually comes back to the colony with these warriors. And there's a lot of shenanigans that ensue where the... Um, uh, they save uh, Princess Dot, which is the younger daughter of uh, of the Queen, and people are led to believe that they are actually indeed warriors. And they come up with this massive scheme of protect, uh, like creating a contraption that mimics like a bird, because grasshoppers are afraid of the birds that are in the area, and they intend to kind of trick the um the grasshoppers so they could go away and they never come back Mm -hmm. so when autumn comes back around they you know they spring their trap they try to trick the grasshoppers but it doesn't quite work out and the grasshoppers are basically find out about this plan and they're about to uh, kill flick and they're going to kill the queen as well but then Everyone says, like in the ant colony, enough is enough. They all kind of stand together in solidarity, and um, just as that moment, the uh, the actual bird um, in the area like swoops on everyone, ends up killing Hopper, and basically the grasshoppers go away, and it's kind of happy ending. Um, that's kind of the general idea, but I guess what I wanted to discuss tonight is that. Whilst this tale isn't as clean as Monsters, Inc. and its kind of revolutionary um, undertones, there are some very specific scenes within it that you can turn around and say, yeah, like, um, it is very pro-union. It is very pro-revolutionary. And um, the first aspect of this is obviously Hopper and the Grasshoppers. So. you know, it's the ver- like it's basically the first couple of scenes when you know Flick uses his inventions and he basically destroys the the offering, the uh, protection offering that they were going to give uh, the grasshoppers, and Hopper does this massive monologue where he's like, "Well, um, my queen, you know how how this whole structure works." the the gro- sorry the the ants pick the food the grasshoppers eat the food and the ants stay in line so there's again we've got a story where there's this propaganda that um there are big and worse things that are out there were the big bad that is willing to protect you us us grasshoppers are benevolent creatures that you know you should be very um uh, you should be very happy that we would be able to protect you. So you do what I, what we say or, or else basically. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, analogous, um, not only with a ruling class um, and a subservient class, but it's also analogous with the idea of a state apparatus that uses coercion or force mm. to rule over uh, its population because it's justified on the basis that it's providing some type of a service. Mm. So like you give up a bit of your freedom, but you're protected and the state will look out for you. But if you step out of line, you'll, you'll feel the full weight of the system against you. Um, So like going back to what you said a bit earlier, I'm not sure if um, you uh, meant it in this way, but I think the revolutionary overtones or um, implications of this story are huge. Yes. Actually, quite obvious. It's whether or not you could derive, like you could with Monsters, Inc., a strong socialist interpretation of this piece. But like mm. you were saying, you could read into it that there's definitely elements of um, or, or a story that's based around kind of a union movement and solidarity 
um, and kind of the workers struggle against the state and against the working class. So why not? It might not be clean, kind of socialist, you know, general um, mm. talking points like seizing the means of production. That's a massive element in socialism. Um, there's no seize of the means of production here because there's no real ownership of any type of technology um, or like dispute over who kind of is um, producing. Like it's quite clear the ants are producing and they're doing it using their own means. It's just who's subservient to who. That's the real mm. storyline here. Um, and on what grounds um, comes that submissive, submissive relationship. Mm. And so that's why I think the revolutionary um, element here is quite clear because the revolution in this case is just an overthrow of the current social organisation um, within this, you know, this kind of ant hill slash ant island paradise. Um, they're trying to overthrow, or oh, well, they will attempt at one point once they realise that they have the potential that they're going to actually try and overthrow the, the status quo, the establishment, um, which is the grass helpers kind of rule and the ants kind of provide things and that's that's their lot in life basically. Yeah. So it's definitely a revolutionary tale whether or not it can be read any further from yeah, like a socialist kind of communist um, uh, interpretation or an anarchist interpretation. I think there's room for exploration in that regard. And I think it's something that you're very interested in discussing. Uh, well, look, I'm happy to talk about it now because uh, I, I guess what I wanted to pitch was, okay, so the fact that, you know, the, the story is about a, a colony of ants, the idea of a union struggle uh, I, I feel like it's pretty one-to-one -one because when you think of ants, you think, you know, they basically work together as a team and it, it, it then, it, like, it has that kind of union undertones to it that it's very one-to-one. -one. But what I was wondering is because it has that kind of union undertones, um, you know, the tale la last week was obviously a Marxist one, could you make a pitch uh, that maybe this is an anarcho-syndicalist tale? So hmm. with we, we've talked about anarchism before, but yeah. specifically with anar uh, anarcho-syndicalists is the idea of, hey, we're creating a society that doesn't have too many, uh, too many structures in it, or if it has structures in it, um, they're only, you know, the, the bare minimum and they must be fully justified in them existing within, within the, I guess, society. And at least the pitch by anarcho-syndicalists is that it's actually the unions that are dictating, um, you know, what the means of production are or what exists in society. And it's actually the unions banding together to create the politics in society and what it deems is um, uh, good in society in terms of structure and what is it. So it's very much doubling down on the uh, the union mentality and various unions coming together in order to form society. And um, well, the the at least the implication at the end of the film is like when everyone comes together and there's that kind of inverse of um, Hopper's initial speech of you know. The grasshop, uh, sorry, the the pants pick uh, the ants pick the food. The grasshoppers eat the food. The ants get in line, and the there's the inv uh, inverse of that um, that speech by Princess Anna, where they're like, "Well, the ants pick the food, the ants eat the food, and the grasshoppers leave." And yeah. then everyone yeah. like stands up and they join arms mm. and it's like you, you see this like union picket line and they march yeah. forward yeah. and yeah. the, the grasshoppers get scared and they kind of run off. Yeah. And I think that's a really important yeah. kind of line there 
the you know the the ants eat the food as well yeah. and the grasshoppers leave because yeah an anarch- anarchism that and like if you look at it it's it's um it's a it's a theory or it's a, a way of understanding the world based on individual freedom as the primary goal of, of all things um so any society um organization or social organization that would promote that to the greatest degree so you don't have formal structures um you don't have um yeah any type of hierarchical um organization because there shouldn't be a position where one person is um subjugated by another etc 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 unless it's fully justified um and any type of hierarchy or organization is only put up temporarily because it can justify itself to serve a certain purpose and it's mm. dismantled after that. Now that's that's a really broad kind of understanding of anarchism right there. So anarcho syndicalism, like you know, as as you mentioned before, has a focus on work. And like in what you were talking about is trade unions or union organization all that sort of stuff so the the way that society would be structured in an anarcho syndicalist way would be to focus or use people's work or their industry as the kind of the pillars or the form work of social organization so mm-hmm. instead of organizing people politically um, or geopolitically based on their geography or um, where they're you know, their, their boundaries are in their electorates or something like that in like a democratic society, you would organise it based on what your trade is, what your occupation is on a daily routine. So if you're a, um, a health care worker or you know, um, you work in childcare or education or something like that, you would be slotted in to your trade, your trade union, mm. and that's how society would work. You would go and be a part of that union and that union would make the decisions um, economically for the whole of society that are in the interest of people working in that union Mm. and then they would come together with other unions from other industries and their central committees and their delegates and stuff like that would decide as a collective based on all of the different industries that come together to make that economy and that society work, Mm. they would make um, all the political decisions in that society and make the world function based on people's work and their contribution to society economically. And so, yes, you could have an anarcho syndicalist kind of interpretation of um, a bug's life here in the sense that the ants, they pick the food, so then they're going to eat the food. They all have the same occupation. Mm. So they're all working towards the same thing. Best they have a central committee. Don't get me wrong, and they're really mm. kind of, you know, feudal or, um, or like you know, they're they're a monarchy, I guess, because there's a queen ant and a couple of princesses and stuff. But really, they're not like um, the type of you know all powerful kind of. They don't care about their subjects, all of that sort of stuff. It's not that type of feel or sentiment you get through the movie. It's more just they're just a big community with kind of a central committee that kind of oversees the the the, the roles and the functions of all the other ants to make sure mm-hmm. they're all rowing in the same direction kind of thing, which is very akin to a union movement mm-hmm. or a anarcho-syndicalist type society you have a big group of workers that are all in the same area so these in this case they're all ants picking the food and they organize themselves in a certain way and they come to decisions in a certain way that's in all the interests of all of those workers because they're all interrelated um, with one another so yeah i think you could you could definitely have that look even though they're not relating to other trades and stuff like that. Um, specifically, you could see, and I think this is an element that we need to discuss about how to fit this puzzle into the larger picture here, 
with the warrior ants, not the warrior ants, the warrior well, bugs. Sorry. Oh, well, the warrior, the warrior bugs, and the circus. Well, well, well they're actually the circus bugs. Um, right. Yes, it's where where to put them because that's obviously the element of whether you see this as a union struggle or um, an anarcho syndicalist tale. Um, they're kind of the odd ones out, which uh, like if you use that anarcho syndicalist kind of framework. Like it does make sense that you have then you look at these warrior bugs who are actually actors or circus people. Like they're all in a similar trade then. They're all in one kind of workplace there. And they're they're quite cohesive and they work together. There's no real hierarchy, I think, in that group. There are a couple of um wiser ones that like, you know, kind of help make the decisions and give direction. Mm. And there's the ones that, you know, do the flying and transport them everywhere and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, so like they have their, their own divisions um, to help make their little group work. But like, if you treat them as another kind of trade union in a sense, and you have them working alongside the answers to kind of cooperating industries, you could mm. argue that they come together as of working parties or groups of collections of workers to overthrow a landlord or a, or a capitalist kind of class. I think you're onto something because I think that interpretation can work if you, um, once you consider that, um, well, this whole movie, uh, the groups of pe- the groups of people, whether that's the ants, the circus bugs, everything, they seem to rel- uh, they seem to relate to each other via work. So whether that's the groups yeah. of ants um, picking the food for the grasshoppers, um, it's the grasshoppers that exploit this kind of work. Mm. And then once everyone jumps onto the idea of creating the bird machine. Um, you know, there's a very prominent scene in in the movie where um, they're obviously raising the the bird uh, the bird machine up into the tree so it can swing down and scare the grasshoppers, and the circus bugs, the ants, they're all working together to move the 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 bird up. And basically, like I feel like the film is also not only the ants but the circus bugs it's kind of everyone realizing that their work matters yes and under that guise you could probably say that all everything that happened that led up to the moment of princess anna and the the ants standing up to the grasshoppers and saying you know, the ants pick the food, the ants eat the food, and the grasshoppers leave. Yeah. Like that is um, like every piece of work that they do, it leads up to that moment. Yeah. And that's actually kind of reinforced to um, in one of basically the, the scenes that's in the middle of the movie where we actually see the grasshoppers um, dive bar or like where they hang out when they're not exploiting the um, uh, exploiting the ants. And what's very interesting, like you use a very interesting uh, phrase. It, it, well, just like a, I would say about five minutes ago is that the um, where the ants live is a paradise. And what's interesting, though, is that when we see the see the dive bar that the grasshoppers live in, it's just a complete desert, mm. and it's almost as if they're capitalists that have ex- completely exploited the area that's around them, and all all that's left is um, a dive bar that's served by a bunch of mosquitoes. Yeah. And um, yeah, like all, all the only thing that matters in that dive bar is whatever like uh, drinks they're having and the massive um, accumulation of grain. Yes. And um, again, this is the second part of Hopper's uh, speeches is one of the um, what one of his underlings, Hopper's underlings goes like, oh, you know, Hopper, like, why do we have to go back at the end of the summer? We've got so much food. Like, can't we just leave them be? Like, you know, they're just worthless ants. Mm. And 
Hopper very deliberately goes to him. He's like, oh yeah, of course, they're just worthless ants. Um, you know, you know, this piece of grain, it's a worthless ant. And he just throws it at the grasshopper uh, hopper, and he's like, did you feel that? And he's like, oh, no. He goes, well, what about this, this grain? And he like throws another piece, another piece. And he goes, okay, well, what about this? And he pulls out the, um, like the pipe and like mm. the grain just comes rushing out. And basically these grasshoppers that were questioning his, his leadership get buried alive. And yeah. then Hopper stands on the mound and is like, see guys, if we don't put these ants in line, they will overrun run us. There is a hundred of them to one of us. They yeah. need to be put in their place. Yeah. And again, it reinforces the union idea of um, when bosses uh, you know, uh, basically divide and conquer, that's when you have exploited masses. Mm. And it, it, you know, that uh, what he says in that speech is obviously put in contrast of w- the speech he says at the beginning and then what a- Princess Anna says them at the end of the movie. But it's a very powerful scene where it shows that, um, well, that basically Hopper and the grasshoppers are, you know, the bad capitalist boss or, you know, to use a phrase from Rosa Luxemburg, that they're a cartel of, mm-hmm. um, of uh, capitalists that are exploiting their, their workers yeah. um, and exploiting the industry to basically sap it of all of, it, all of its wealth. Yeah, I think it's really um, important or it's, it's quite clever of, uh, it's Pixar again, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Um, quite clever of how they've kind of invoked the um, the idea of some type of a ruling class or a, a leisure class that sits on top of the ants and feeds off them um, to survive by looking or painting that picture of having a couple of grasshoppers who raise a really good point. Yes, they're kind of defying um, Hopper and his direction, um, but like basically they're, they're coming at him with the point that hey we've got enough to stuff to survive why should we even go back and deal with these ants we're comfortable basically mm. we're comfortable here why should we go back we've got more than enough to provide for our own needs which is a really important part of class warfare um, and the struggle between ruling classes and working classes it's, it's the idea that the ruling class in a society really does have more than is necessary. Like in terms of its wealth accumulation, it has well more than it ever needs to survive. Mm. Anything beyond what they need to survive is just opulence um, and, you know, wealth for the sake of just having more stuff. And so by questioning that and saying, hey, we've got enough stuff, why do we need more? and him doing the dramatic thing where he crushes them under the weight of the working class, um, which outnumbers them 100 to 1, it's directly painting, it's directly commenting on the fact that it's not about having enough stuff or, or, you know, it's really just got to do with controlling people at the end of the day. It's got nothing to do with whether a ruling class, a capitalist class or a landlord class that rents or... Um, taxes uh, their mm. people into submission um, and by coercion. It's not about whether they need more stuff so they can survive. It's got nothing to do with that. It's just about maintaining a power dynamic. And as uh, importantly to that, it's about making sure that the other class, the majority mm. that does all the working, is aware that they must produce for their masters um, to survive because to let them go just for a second and just to have one ant that steps out of line will be the tipping point and could unravel their whole um, situation and their Mm. whole beautiful arrangement, which is exactly what the whole story is about. It's about one eccentric ant who has some pretty crazy ideas about how to So, like, you could bring this back to a socialist kind of interpretation, how to improve the means of production for the ants that actually own them themselves and make their production and their life easier 
and he has some pretty crazy ideas, but those ideas end up being or resulting in such a subversive ideology that it completely turns on its head the society that they live in mm-hmm. and ends up invoking in all of them and an adjoining kind of industry being these circus bugs. It invokes in all of them this fever um, and this taste for revolution. Mm. And so, like, it's, yeah, it's just really interesting how they've framed that scene right in the middle of the piece there in, like you are saying, in this desolate kind of capitalist wasteland environment where they do actually have everything that they need to survive. But it's, it's made very clear that it's got nothing to do with what their wants and needs. It's just got to do with reinforcing the power structure. And that's... That's a big part, I guess, of the anarcho-syndicalist struggle is recognising that there is no need for private property and the state in order to run society and that if you have collections of workers that form themselves into trade, into unions and then, by extension, larger trade unions, those pillars of society, those... um, those large um, organisations can run themselves in a directly democratic way and then come together, like um, convene, if you will, to provide the direction for society. There's no need for a state apparatus, any force Mm. or control, any of that traditional hierarchical or power structure. Yes, because, okay, the other interesting things that are, are are really good about that middle scene with Hopper as well is it kind of nicely ties back to the Aesop's fable of the ant and the grasshopper because um, him saying like, oh, okay, yes, we have everything that we need today, but what about tomorrow? Like mm-hmm. that kind of links back that if the grasshoppers do not... Um, continue their stranglehold on the ants, then they'll be completely at a loss um, maybe in, you know, the the next summer or maybe the summer after that when all of their supply is gone because um, because that's the also another very interesting thing about that scene is that they're all being served by mosquitoes. And... Um, you know, everyone knows that a mosquito like leeches off people's blood. So there was that that metaphor in there that um, these grasshoppers are basically leeches on the the union of the of the ants. That they're basically exploiting them of their resources, but not really providing anything. Which, again, is 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 a huge propaganda revolutionary point. Mm-hmm. Is that the capitalist society that are uh, subjugating the working class? They're basically kind of leeching off them, and they're not really adding any value themselves mm-hmm. to their labour. And I, th- I, would, I, th- I see. I would, I would argue that the grasshoppers are less of a capitalist class in this story and more of a landlord class. Okay. Um, like you would have like a, a feudal lord or you had your landlords, um, kind of your aristocracy um, yeah. and stuff like that. They, they have things by birthright, but they don't contribute anything. Now, uh, you know, um, some people might not like this, but capitalists, yes, they do not work um, and they don't, produce um, because they they own the means of production but they don't use the means of production but like they still contribute to society their efforts their capital accumulation and their investment back into the system does produce things for the economy and doesn't produce things for a society although they have complete control over it and like they use the the rules or the rules they use it in a competitive manner, um, they are still contributing something to that system in terms of their decision-making or where they decide to invest um, or, you know, what they're going to pour um, their their wealth into or their next project into and stuff like that. But they're, they're mm-hmm. actively contributing in one way or another. They're not working. 
okay, to produce stuff, fine, I give you that. But a landlord class does absolutely nothing. They're just the owners of private property or the owners of, of some thing that they leech and they suck the life out of, um, like, inadvertently. So, like, you know, maybe they hold government bonds or something like that, or maybe they've invested in something particular. And so the working class that produces all of the wealth for society, they use their, their private property or whatever they have access to to suck that value out and feed off it. So the grasshoppers don't work. And then they pretend, like, maybe they'd be capitalists if you actually saw a scene of them fighting off some other bugs to protect the ants. But there's no insinuation in that movie at all that they're actually providing any protection to the ants. Like it's just, I think, part of the myth to help justify why the ants need to feed them and offer them things. But like in actuality, they're not really defending them from anything at all. Well, the only threat we see in the movie uh, is the bird, the bird. and, ev- and everyone knows and that grasshoppers are afraid of birds. Yeah. So, so like they can't even offer protection from the birds and stuff like or the yeah. bird, um, which is the one thing that does terrorize um, the ants. And the only time you actually see, and that's that's a really good point because the only time you actually see anyone effectively sticking up to this bird, this terrorizing agent that has the ability to, you know, attack all at random is when the the warrior bugs come along and they have to save the princess Mm. using their special talents and their skills with the ants and they get rid of the bird somehow and they save the day and stuff like that. And that's, again, a coming together of two different industries and they work together to solve a larger issue at play, which is a natural Mm. phenomenon that sits above this whole class system in this society. Mm. Mm. But, like, you know, getting back to to the the grasshoppers, I see them more as a landlord class, which which has always been a part of the capitalist system. Um, You know, it predates the capitalist system. it's a big part of most societies and social evolution, if you will. You have a group of people that kind of hold things. I like to call them a leisure class. They're unproductive and they feed off everyone else's um, productive power. Um, so, you yeah, know, I would, and like I even see them as less lesser than a capitalist class. Like don't get me mm. wrong, I think capitalists are despisable um uh like utterly but like they do contribute something landlords it's not useful yeah okay i i could uh i could come around to uh seeing the uh grasshoppers as a um as a landlord class uh uh, rontiers Rontiers. yes a rontier class um yeah i could come around to that and um yeah okay well, I feel like we've had a pretty good discussion today. Mm. Um, okay, I guess at this point, I'll, I'll probably point out that, uh, again, another synthwave art in the background. The uh, prompt for this one was um, a bug's life re- revolution against the grasshoppers. So, uh, again, I'll make sure to release the art uh, to my page. And... Thank you for tuning in again, guys. Just remember to keep thinking and keep learning. And to sign us off, I'll give it off to you, Mr. E. Thank you, 4AS. And to all of you out there, please remember, I am, you are, we are a mystery. <laughs>